While we don't often like to talk about it, most of us do it or will at least do it sometime or other. Since the dawn of time, we've been making love and seeing as for about 100,000 years humans have anatomically been the same, we know those folks we sometimes called cavemen or cavewomen were getting it on inside their rather sparse homes. They didn't, however, have magazines like Cosmopolitan to guide them through their lovemaking rituals. Life Science tells us it wasn't until the 1800s that we really opened up about what we got down to under the sheets. And then in the 1960s we really started talking openly about our desires. The question is, do we all do it the same way? We said that Western culture started talking more about making love in the 19th century, but as many of you will know, there's a little book called the Karma Sutra that's said to have been written sometime in the 3rd century. The man behind the Kama Sutra, which means something like treatise of pleasure, was an Indian sage called Vatsyayan. The premise of the book is the art of living well, but part of living well was understanding the art of carnal pleasure. Contrary to popular opinion, it wasn't just about certain positions, but also gave advice on etiquette, marriage, and how to be attractive, how to date, sometimes called courting, how to have affairs, and it also gave women advice on what kind of man they should be looking for. We're told that in one part it tells women they should give a wide berth to men who talk a lot, drink too much, and to stay well away from guys whose breath smells like crows. We can't say we've ever smelled a crow here at the Infographics Show, but we imagine they must stink. Yep, the book is starting to sound like an ancient version of Cosmopolitan. But what about making love? What was the advice? We can of course infer that the advice was heated and so 3rd century Indians might have made love this way. We should say that there have been many updates to this book and the positions have been given lots of names. We looked at 245 of them and could say many look like some kind of intertwined yoga, or perhaps a game of Twister in which the two players are connected by the nuts and bolts we call genitalia. This book also includes some standard positions including the coital alignment technique aka the cat, or what some people might call missionary. No doubt even the cave guys and girls were doing the cat when taking a break from hunting woolly mammoths. One of our favorites is the harp, although it would take a very nimble woman to do her part in making the instrument. All we could say without going through every position is that those 3rd century Indians certainly got creative in bed, and some of them must have been very flexible or prone now and again to painful muscle cramps. We also know lovemaking is the whole shebang, not just the coitus part. Lovemaking includes kissing, caressing, and whatever one might do as part of sensual pleasure with another person. And some cultures just don't kiss, or at least kissing is not as common as it is in some parts of the West. We say not as common because times are changing and while some grandparents might not have bumped tongues when they were preparing themselves to create a new generation, their grandkids might well right now be mixing their saliva with commendable skill. Research from the University of Nevada tells us that only 48% of 168 cultures they looked at kissed like Westerners kiss, and some find it kinda gross. The Mahinku people of Brazil said exactly that. The Acapygmies don't kiss at all, and they even called making love a night's work. For them, getting it on was just about trying to conceive and they certainly weren't looking for tips in magazines about how to best tie your lover to the bedpost. One of the researchers said most western and industrial or post-industrial cultures now have it, while most small-scale societies, hunter-gatherer, pastoral, and small horticultures do not. There are lots of types of kissing too. Some cultures might prefer the oceanic kiss, which can be found in some parts of Malaysia. This form of kissing means getting close and rubbing an open mouth against another open mouth without the suction part. That country's next door neighbor is Thailand, and traditional kissing there is sometimes a sniff kiss, which involves putting your nose on someone's cheek and taking a quick sniff. You can read forums where expatriates say they first encountered this kind of kissing, they thought it was really cute. Then there's the well-known Eskimo kiss, which just means rubbing noses. You can find this all over Southeast Asia, but also within the Maori of New Zealand, Bengali people and of course Inuits. Now let's move on to the more intense foreplay. We should say that not all cultures have this kind of thing, like the Aka Pygmies. Some cultures get right down to business for the most part. Putting one's head in certain places is seen as impolite in some cultures around the world. Again, we must stress that a lot has changed in the last few decades and young people will have a very different lovemaking method than old people in some or probably most cultures. Talk to grandpa about the scissoring technique that you've nailed and he might give you a blank look. 
Although that sage that wrote that Kama Sutra would probably give you a pat on the back and a gold star. In fact, one researcher said that many people in Eastern cultures will engage in foreplay, simple caressing and the rest for very long periods of time. That person wrote, in Western cultures, varied patterns of foreplay can be found, but these all tend to be short in duration and to be seen as something that leads up to the main event of intercourse. According to him, in the East, many partners might just do this without a main event, while in the West it's seen as mainly a preamble to the main course. Call it an aperitif for some or perhaps a mousse-bouche for the more creative of us. The same writer said that many cultures have their own ways of providing this arousal. He wrote that the Trobrian Islanders of Melanesia, for instance, might bite each other's lips until they see blood, which is apparently enjoyable for them. More research informs us that Apine women of South America might take a bite of their partner's eyebrow to arouse him, while that same article tells us that Truquis females of the South Pacific will sometimes poke a finger in one of the ears of their lover. Live science tells us that in some parts of rural Austria, part of arousing a man might be for the woman to put a slice of apple under her sweaty armpit and give it to him to eat. The Huffington Post, however, says that this doesn't happen anymore. We can't understand why. Overall, we're told that for the most part, the more developed a country is, the more people might be inclined to spice up their lovemaking with pre-coitus playing. For instance, just in 2018, the Ugandan president, Yoweri Museveni, said outside influences were corrupting the Ugandan public. He said mouths should be for eating. You know what he was referring to. We're not quite sure if the public agrees with him, though. We might add that certain techniques for arousal were illegal in many countries in the past, including parts of the USA, so it's not hard to see why grandparents might not have been very experimental lovemakers. There are also differences in preparation especially in tribal cultures. You probably didn't know that in Mangia, an island in the South Pacific Ocean, the young boys will be given an experienced woman to make love to so that they will learn quickly. In the Sambian tribe of New Guinea, we're told boys' preparation involves drinking a very natural cocktail made of the strongest warriors in the tribe. Such initiations might also happen in other cultures, but they're dying out in most societies. The British healthcare company Dr. Felix went all around the world and tried to understand bedroom habits. It tells us that Indians are the most satisfied in their lovemaking, which might have something to do with that great book created over there. We're also informed that the Scandinavians have the most one-night stands, while the Danes apparently had the most affairs. The survey said English-speaking countries get up to the kinkiest action, and another survey cited by Vox said that people from Nigeria and Mexico have the most exciting time under the sheets. As for countries where people complained of not getting enough physical love, Japan won the gold, followed by the United States. That survey also asked when people started making love, and it seems South Americans were doing it on average at the youngest age. Asians waited the longest, with Europe and North America in the middle. As for how long we make love? That's complicated because every survey we looked at had different results. The Conversation website had perhaps the most reliable data, and it said it could last anywhere from 33 seconds to 44 minutes. Couples all over the world were told to write down their session results and give back data after a few weeks. It was found that the world average was somewhere around 5.4 minutes. In all, it could be fast or slow, but averages around the world were pretty much all around the 4-5 to five minute mark. Other surveys tell us that the Greeks were making love the most, but the Thais were doing it most in cheat mode. We might add here that up until recent times in parts of Asia such as Thailand, Japan, China, and elsewhere, a woman was quite subservient toward a man. Men might have consorts, second wives, while it's only in the last couple of decades that women were even open about their desires. Europeans, of course, the men at least, openly had mistresses too, but we have to go back further in time. Still, in many parts of the world today, it's quite normal for men to have second wives and mistresses, but we won't go into this now. Let's finish the show on a lighter note and let's talk for just a few seconds about how we make these videos, since it's a very common question. Besides using Adobe After Effects to animate the videos, we help speed up the process by sometimes using pre-made assets or even templates from Envato Elements. I'm sure you already know websites like Audio Jungle, Video Hive, and Graphic River. Well, Envato owns all of them, and what they did now is pretty awesome. They've compiled almost 1 million assets from all of their sites and are making them available for a small monthly fee. They keep adding more every month. 
And if you sign up using our link in the description, you'll not only get an unlimited amount of downloads, you'll also support us in the process. Quick note, some vectors and music used in today's video were from Envato Elements. Check them out. Well, the best thing we can do now is ask all of you international lovemakers what you think about all this. Many of you might still be young, so do you think years back lovemaking was any different where you come from? How is it now? Tell us in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other show, What Happens to Your Body While You're Having Intercourse. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.